Howard on the phone. Tim Kuhner, professor of law at the Georgia State University College of Law and author of the newly released Capitalism versus Democracy, Money and Politics and the Free Market Constitution. Uh, professor, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. And, and please call me Tim. Tim. All right. Great. Um, so uh, you've, you've, run, uh, you've written a, a, a very helpful, um, um, uh, uh, basically tracking our, the, uh, the change in, in our uh, approach to campaign finance, uh, specifically uh, via the, the Supreme Court over the past, uh, really, I guess, uh, 40 years now. And um, let, let's just start with the notion of uh, of how how you think um, campaign finance and the idea, the relationship between money and politics was contemplated uh, in the Constitution and at our founding. I don't think it was contemplated in any depth at the time. Campaigns were not nearly uh, as expensive as they are today. In fact, it doesn't even make sense to compare them. The nature of our country at the time of its independence was agrarian. I mean, we hadn't even gone through the Industrial Revolution yet, never mind the mass media revolution. So uh, the uh, campaign finance scandals back in the 1700s had to do with candidates spending some of their own money to buy their supporters cakes and ale, uh, that sort of thing, in order to get people out to the polls to vote. It wasn't uh, the wholesale conversion of politics into an economic marketplace with all of these different donors and spenders and investors. So at the time, the, the, the concerns that were had back then were much more pressing, and they were about other issues, right? Could we keep the English away? Could we keep the French and the Spanish away? Could we uh, separate powers? Could we separate church and state? Uh, what were we going to do about slavery and so on? And, and I, I mean, I think, that, uh, you know, uh, so, so, I mean, we, that, that takes us up uh, on some level to this, this confluence between the, 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 the notion of democracy and the notion of uh, so-called free market capitalism, uh, which, which I, is it fair to say this is this is basically uh, this confluence uh, happens around Buckley v. Vallejo, and 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 if so, what, what, where were we before Buckley v. Vallejo? Before we talk about that case, we before Buckley v. Vallejo, we were at a pivotal, and I mean pivotal, pivotal moment in U.S. history, which is the confrontation of the country and specifically the U.S. Congress with the question of whether economic power should be the new means of political exclusion. So we, had, we were fresh off of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. We were fresh off the abolition of poll taxes through the 24th Amendment. And there was this moment in the 1970s where the question was, would the democratic evolution continue to allow meaningful democracy for more and more people to the point at which ordinary Americans could exercise meaningful political power. And that's what Rawls was writing about in 1971 in his theory of justice. He talked about how the the, uh, theory of our Constitution ought to be that those who are similarly endowed and motivated should have the same chance of obtaining positions of political authority, regardless of their economic and social class. So we were in that kind of a pivotal, pivotal, my goodness, it's going to be an awkward interview, I can tell already, <laughs> moment in U.S. history. And that's when, uh, also at the same time that Rawls was writing, the U.S. Congress was drafting the Federal Election Campaign Act. And the can that act, which was the first comprehensive reform of campaign finance in the United States, contained eventually limits on donations and limits on expenditures. And so, uh, and the other thing going on in the 70s, of course, was Milton Friedman and his movement, right, from these sort of unpopular economic views coming out of uh, entitlement programs and coming out of the post-World War II era where the middle class was growing and capitalism was becoming more accessible for people. Uh, coming out of that process, Milton Friedman pushed back against the government, pushed back against regulation, pushed back against entitlements, and sort of developed this faith in free markets as wiser and better 
than government. So all of that was going on. And when the Supreme Court entered the scene in Buckley in 1976, they had to choose between Milton Friedman and uh, Rawls. And they chose Friedman. All right. Well, tell us, I mean, tell us about uh, what was uh, what was the uh, Buckley v. Vallejo case? Buckley v. Vallejo is the case in which FICA, the Federal Election Campaign Act, which was passed throughout the 70s uh, before and after Watergate, was challenged uh, by Senator Buckley. And the court had to consider the constitutionality mainly uh, of donation limits so that individual donors couldn't contribute more than a thousand and something at the time, and expenditure limits, which were binding on candidates and outside parties and and so on. So the the idea, uh, Congress was very clear in its goals uh, behind FICA, and the goals consisted in in combating uh, corruption and the appearance of corruption, equalizing the relative ability of all citizens to affect the outcome of elections. That's a big one, right? Political equality. And three, slowing the skyrocketing costs of political campaigns, opening the political system more widely to candidates without access to sources of large amounts of money. So the congressional purposes are very much in line with Rawls's idea of a republic in which even a poor person or a middle class person could uh, be an equal citizen uh, in comparison to a, a wealthy person. And so Congress was on board with that, but the Supreme Court really wasn't. And so uh, the Buckley case produced the first, uh, you know, what I call acts of uh, of alchemy, right? Really converting one thing into another. And so the the Burger Court in Buckley converts money into speech, and they say we've never held that uh, the funding of speech uh, accomplishes anything like uh, reducing the constitutional protections available for political speech. And so they really say the funding of it is is irrelevant, whether it's big money or small money or what have you. The fact that it's money doesn't affect the product being produced, which is speech. And so they equate money with speech. And uh, Buckley also does a really important thing in saying that political equality is a a goal that is uh, wholly foreign to the First Amendment which was one of Congress's goals, right, to restrict the speech of some elements of our society to enhance the relative voice of others. The court in Buckley says that's wholly foreign to the First Amendment. And, and I, mean, uh, I mean, give me your sense of that, because, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is speech a dynamic or does it exist in sort of a vacuum, right? I mean, that's, if... if I- I mean, that's the dyna- that that's that's the question in terms of what the force First Amendment is about. Yeah, the the court sees speech as just existing. And once speech has been uttered, it's sacred. And it doesn't matter whether that speech has been uttered and publicized uh, through corporate general treasury funds or by the lady, uh, your neighbor, right, who's out in the town plaza saying, I have this sincerely held viewpoint that I'd like to communicate to you, my fellow citizens. The court sees absolutely no difference. And in the, uh, the McCutcheon case, which was decided just this past April, uh, the court says that when uh, donors and spenders uh, use their money to produce political speech, they're uh, They're producing protected forms of political expression and political association. And the court says, quote, those rights are important regardless of whether the individual is a lone pamphleteer or street corner orator in the Tom Paine mold or is someone who spends substantial amounts of money in order to communicate his political ideas through sophisticated means. So there you have it, right? Tom Paine is just identical to one of the Koch brothers, in their view. Now, and and we should just say, uh, McCutcheon is the case that basically uh, blew off the aggregate uh, limits that uh, could be uh, given by uh, an individual to uh, races across the country. And there's a lot of sort of loopholes. Uh, it imagines that money is infungible. There's a lot of problems with it. We'll get to that um, in a bit. But so now from from your perspective, is that is is the problem with that interpretation of the First Amendment? Is there a, is that problematic or is it that there is no uh, I mean, we, we do uh, constrain speech in this country when there is an overriding uh, societal concern, right? I mean, you can't right. yell fire in a uh, in a crowded theater is the most obvious one. But uh, so, w- at what point do, do, is the is the question of their interpretation of the First Amendment problematic, or is it their question of uh, 
of whether or not um, there is a compelling reason to uh, to constrain that speech. That the court has both problems. Uh, their interpretation of the First Amendment is unjustified uh, in terms of the history of the First Amendment and the level of specificity con- contained in that amendment. So Congress shall uh, make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Well, what does the freedom of speech mean and what does abridging mean? Because in uh, the Bennett case and uh, the Davis case, which are cases about the financing of campaigns, uh, whether there can be public financing that's effective, whether there can be uh, advantages for publicly financed candidates when they're facing off against very wealthy candidates. The court has said that uh, very effective forms of public financing are unconstitutional because they diminish the effectiveness of private speech, by which they mean private donations and expenditures from the very rich. So the court has read that clause about Congress shall not make any law abridging the freedom of speech to be a hypersensitive needle. And when you diminish the incentives for market transactions, for spending and donating on political goods and services, you've now violated the First Amendment. And so that, that kind of interpretation is problematic per se. All right. I want to I just stop there and just to sort of walk people through that because it's really important because in that instance, they are not saying that speech is in a vacuum, right? Because we're talking about campaign finance laws that would uh, sort of kick in extra money if you were running it that, that would basically uh, equal the playing field if mm-hmm. you're if you someone you're running against is privately funded beyond uh, even where the uh, original public uh, uh, financing contemplated and so in that instance they're perceiving speech as being a dynamic right that uh, you are diminishing this uh, millionaire's voice if the government goes in and provides more campaign funding for someone who's running on a publicly financed campaign, because then all of a sudden speech is relative, right? I mean, that's the contradiction. Exactly. exactly. So that, that's why the court is really doing both things. Uh, on the one hand, they're maintaining and telling us that a, a privatized marketplace for speech has to be protected and the Supreme Court sees that as its role. So when the government intervenes into this privatized market and subsidizes the publicly financed candidate, uh, even though the government's only injecting more money in the market, and even though the government's not limiting private spenders or, or donors in that case, it's interrupting what the court sees as a sacred, natural level of private funding. And if you interrupt that, you can't expect markets to do their job. I mean, in that instance, it seems to me that it's protecting uh, a a notion of the free market as opposed to the notion of speech. That's right. And, and again, this is exactly why the court is making every kind of mistake you can imagine. Uh, they've, they've first off, they see money as speech, and they look at it in this sort of deontological, like very pure. This this is a right in and of itself, and it doesn't matter what the consequences are. But they also make the other mistake and say this right has to do with this right is located within an economic market, and that's how we know what its function is. Right, the right of free speech is maintaining open markets as opposed to regulated markets. And so that's an instrumental take, which seeks to accomplish certain outcomes by protecting the right. So the court will throw every legal theory and every legal mechanism at you to make sure that private capital remains effective and powerful. That's the function of what they're doing, if not their intention as well. And 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 and, and when we say the court, uh, we should note that it, it seems that all of these major sort of landmark cases, we go from uh, Buckley v. Vallejo, uh, and um, we go to, from uh, f- uh, the uh, First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti, uh, where, uh, where in fact Rehnquist uh, fell on the side that um, I think most people who listen to this program would be sympathetic to, um, in terms of the the idea that you can actually uh, constrict the the. The spending of corporations, uh, when it comes to, in this case, it was ballot initiatives. Um, mm-hmm. These have all been; uh, these have not been slam dunks, right? They've all been more or less five four. Is that basically the case? That's right. And in fact, there was greater support during the Rehnquist court years for cases that limited money and that limited corporate power, like Austin. Uh, Austin was a six three case, and Austin is the case that uh, protects. 
against undue influence of aggregate corporate economic power, right? And that is affirmed in McConnell. And then uh, with less support than those other cases, it's struck down in Citizens United. So the, the Roberts Court majority is on the shakiest of footings. It's the narrowest majority you can get on the court. And when we get to Citizens United, uh, that there the issue is less about um, uh, freedom and abridging, right, when it comes to free speech, mm -hmm. and more about the idea that there isn't a compelling state reason to do this. Yes, and that's also what the court does in McCutcheon. They say uh, because political speech is so important, it triggers strict or at least intermediate scrutiny, so the government, in order to limit political speech, meaning, well, corporate general treasury spending or uh, private donations or what have you, uh, the court, the, the Congress and has to have a compelling state interest or at least a sufficient, uh, at least a very important one. And uh, what the court is doing in Citizens United uh, and Buckley, by the way, is saying that uh, most of the interests you could come up with, like political equality and democratic integrity, you're protecting the time of elected office holders so they don't have to fundraise all day. Um, that those kinds of rationales are all insufficient to justify restricting so-called speech. And so the only thing that now justifies restrictions on private spending and uh, donating is the prevention of corruption, by which they mean quid pro quo, bribery-style corruption, not other dynamics that everyone in the world understands to be corrupt. All right, well, so let's just start, I mean, uh, and, and explain to people, when you say um, uh, strict uh, scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, uh, just explain what that means to, um, to the, I'm sure there's one or two people in our audience who doesn't know what that means at this point. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this refers to court-created tests. Uh, so when a legislature is restricting a constitutionally protected right, uh, the court will have to make a decision as to whether the legislature has a good reason for doing that or whether the legislature is just arbitrarily restricting rights. So if, if rights aren't absolute, then it follows that under certain circumstances, government can limit them. So um, what you have, for example, are different levels of scrutiny depending on the importance of the right. And political speech is considered, as well as political association, are considered to be of the utmost importance. Uh, so what you have in strict scrutiny, which is what I would argue the law is, there's a little bit of unclarity uh, on this point, but generally speaking, what the court is looking for is a compelling state interest to justify the restriction of political speech, by which it means spending or donating. And so it scrutinizes, it really, it, it pays very strict attention to why Congress or a state legislature has chosen to regulate campaign finance. So when they're looking for uh, very important or uh, compelling state interests, uh, they're, they're citing the drafting history of the law or the text of the law and saying, does this interest in political equality or this interest in reducing the costs of elections or this interest in preventing bribery, do these interests suffice to warrant a restriction on a constitutional right? And that's where Citizens United, McCutcheon, and even Buckley are very notable cases because they, they really um, restrict and really reduce the realm of reasons or motivations that any lawmaking body could have for regulating campaign financing. So we're down now to a state of the law in which the only thing you can really attempt to do as a regulator is root out actual bribery. And so if you can't connect a law to uh, actual bribery and the prevention of actual bribery, then that law is going to fail if it restricts expenditures or donations. Now, and, and so that is, I mean, that, that, the, the, that part where they make the determination that notions like uh, fairness of, uh, of outcomes or the con concentration of power as it's manifested through someone's ability to uh, buy an election or influence the yeah. outcome of an election with a lot of money. That just doesn't meet the standard. Uh, that, that entire issue, whether or not that's the case, whether or not uh, we mm -hmm. accept the facts that um, you know, Sam Cedar can walk in with his millions of dollars and buy the mayor's race in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yep. irrelevant. The, the, then right. they move on to the question of as to whether or not 
it seems to me in Citizens United, which also stuck out to me in Citizens United, was the question of whether or not this creates corruption narrowly defined or the appearance mm -hmm. of corruption. And that to me seems like a finding of fact that mm -hmm. the court ruled on. I think uh, it was Kennedy who famously said, "Nah, I don't I don't see it. Uh, yeah. And I think this is how they also sort of rejected. Uh, I think it was North Dakota's uh, law. Uh, or maybe it was Montana's in terms of, of, of corporate money. Um, that's a, is that not a finding of fact? And they didn't seem to really dig around much yeah. for that fact. Yeah, they actually don't require a great deal of evidence to show that First Amendment rights have been violated. Now, that's the other part of the equation. You're talking about the part of the equation uh, being, is there corruption, right? And is there corruption to be prevented? Um, and the court, I mean, in McCutcheon, they say that even these $3.6 million uh, amounts that individual donors can now contribute, uh, the implication is that even those $3.6 million amounts from each individual donor uh, wouldn't actually produce quid pro quo corruption. Uh, and they held that the $123,000 limit, which was the prior limit, the one that they struck down, that that limit wasn't related to the prevention of corruption because no voter, no office holder or candidate would be corrupted by receiving the maximum amount uh, from the same donor and having that same donor fund all candidates and all political parties in the maximum amount. Um, so what they're basically in denial of is the possibility of a political oligarchy where big, which is what we have today, where big spenders and big donors are drastically more influential than everybody else put together. And we should also uh, say, let's put an asterisk on there because they didn't know about Bob McDonald at the time. Uh, uh, but uh, th that said, um, uh, so uh, this is where we are at this point. And I mean, from from your perspective, is this been uh, just basically a question of of partisanship or ideology or some mix of both? I'd say it's a mixture of both. Clearly, the justices, as removed as they are from the political fray in terms of uh, having lifetime appointments and uh, not having to worry about their salaries or their jobs, they, they're political animals, and they wouldn't have been, in most cases, nominated and appointed if they weren't sufficiently politically sensitive right, to the needs of their party. And um, so there, there's that. You know, they, know, they understand that the, the, the distributive consequences of their holdings, they understand that they favor the uh, political forces that put them there to begin with. And you see a great deal, uh, except for cases like Souter. I mean, the exceptions are so notable where you get, say, Justice Souter or Chief Justice Rehnquist, who from time to time don't toe the party line. Uh, they're notable. And there was a saying of no more suitors, right? That, right. Uh, Republicans wanted to avoid at any cost a justice who could be that independent so as to not come out their way. So there can be a degree of partisanship, but that's built in to any model of uh, politically appointed judges. Um, and it's probably worse in the case of elected judges. So uh, we're never going to get around that. The, the parts that we can get around, there are two of them. One of them is having a constitution that's completely silent on political finance and money and politics. So that kind of a constitution gives carte blanche to any uh, judge, not even just the Supreme Court justices, but any federal judge or even the state judges who have all sworn to uphold the U.S. Constitution. So that's a problem. Whether you're a progressive or a conservative, you don't want your foundational document to be silent on one of the key pieces of what democracy means, right? So that's one thing. The other thing that I think we can control and need to have input on is this sort of bizarre free market ideology run amok. Because even if you're a free marketeer and you're, the way you understand the world is investment and markets and competition, you should hate this case law. I mean, especially if that's the way you see the world, because it doesn't make sense to have this kind of a case law which routes economic competition into political spending and then brings legislative privileges and tariffs and subsidies and earmarks and so on back into the economic sphere and corrupts capitalism. It just doesn't make sense if you're a free marketeer to support uh, democracy is a market because demo if democracy is a market, then you're not going to have free markets in the economy. All right, so let me let me let me just translate these two uh, two uh, obstacles as you know them. One is that our constitution just simply did not uh, contemplate uh, the idea that people would be spending uh, 
a billion dollars in the presidential election or millions of dollars uh, to elect their congresspeople. And so uh, that silence makes it much easier for someone, uh, for a judge or a justice to uh, to to claim uh, First Amendment absolutism uh, in this realm, and the other is um, if you were a uh, a genuine uh, uh, a conservative sort of libertarian type, and and I'm smiling as I say this because of my experience in in never finding that person, <laughs> um, but you who who rails at the corruption of government. Uh, from c large corporations, which I think is is an accurate assessment, their 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 I guess uh, prescription for that is to shrink the government so it doesn't have the the mm -hmm. the leverage to be worthwhile to be corrupted. Um, so this is this is essentially you know uh, freedom. Uh, you would theoretically want uh, money not to be able to corrupt your politics so that you wouldn't have unnecessary licensing of industries or uh, subsidies or the import-export bank or that type of thing. Um, those people are notably silent on, on any type of campaign finance uh, restrictions. So where does, yeah. so, so let's go back to one where we have a constitution that is silent. Are, do you favor a, a, a constitutional amendment? And, and I have to say that it's, it's it's actually there's been uh, just the other day I think Don Hazen at Alternate um, wrote uh, and I've seen you know other other sort of progressives who see campaign finance as a problem has has written that it's either delusional or um, or even dangerous perhaps to push for a constitutional amendment at this point. Give me your take on that, at least from a legal standpoint and then from a practical standpoint. Sure. From a legal standpoint, I think there's clear analogies to a uh, potential amendment on money in politics. Uh, this, we're dealing still uh, and forever in this country with a legacy of political exclusion. We began the republic with slavery. Uh, and we, even before eliminating slavery, of course, we eliminated the property requirement that prevented white males without property from voting. <laughs> so, and that didn't take a constitutional amendment, but that took a massive push, a push. And, you know, you can look at Andrew Jackson's legacy as really consisting in that and opening up democracy uh, to all white males, <laughs> which was a tremendous challenge. And you've got Doors Rebellion in Rhode Island and things like that. So, uh, you know, up until about 1840 or so, uh, our problem was exclusion of white males without property. And then 1865, you get the abolition of slavery in an amendment, the 13th, due process and equal protection in an amendment, the 14th, black suffrage in the 15th amendment, female suffrage in the 19th amendment, even the abolition of poll taxes took a constitutional amendment in 1964. I see those steps in U.S. history as analogous legally speaking and culturally speaking, to what is required in the case of money in politics. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to eliminate the property requirement for the vote and right. to eliminate poll taxes and to eliminate political exclusion of all these other kinds to come to a moment now in the sort of hyper-capitalist stage where you've got to be a millionaire or a billionaire to have any real influence. The, those and two, the, the property owners and the poll tax seem to me to be most on point because those are the most mm -hmm. explicitly economic. And right. we don't have a, uh, a, a, a federal constitutional right to vote, do we? I mean, is that it, 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 those... The, the the property owners of the poll tax are sort of based on on uh, uh, equal opportunity as opposed to a standing right to vote. Is there? I mean, the yeah. Con I mean, you, I mean the, the Constitution's the con fairly silent in regards to voting, isn't it? There's the guarantee of uh, Republican government, which is a representative form of government, and that's in there that the federal government, uh, the Constitution, guarantees that to the states. Um, and then, and but yeah, I mean, clearly, when you look back at our history, there was no universal right to vote ever, uh, and you know that by virtue of 
the suffrage requirements on you know, the property requirements, uh, you know that by slavery, you know that by female exclusion, and so on. I mean, I, I would talk about it really more in the context of the 1960s and the legacy of Martin Luther King. Uh, Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Acts as being our primary legal material uh, in this in in this way, um, but you know of course the issue these days isn't the right to vote; it's the right to vote in a republic, right? Which is a representative form of governance. If your uh, office, if your um, elected representatives aren't accountable to you as a geographic constituent, that's a real problem. So what, what we see today is the vote has been reduced to a referendum on the market-dominant candidates. You can't vote for the other people. They haven't made it. They haven't been able to mount a viable campaign. They haven't gotten the support of any major party in order to gain any sort of prominence. So the vote is very analogous to going and buying breakfast cereal at the supermarket. You can only buy the ones that they've decided to stock on the shelves, which are the ones who have... Uh, found funding and incorporated and become a company and produce cereal and politics is the same way. And 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 that's a a corruption of the of the 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 process sort of at large. So all right. So from a uh, from a legal uh, standpoint, there's uh, there's precedent here. Um, from a practical standpoint, it's much harder, isn't it? From a practical standpoint, it is much harder, uh, but I would note that all of the major accomplishments that I've mentioned in passing between the uh, between Jacksonian democracy and the abolition of slavery up until the Voting Rights Act were not easy propositions either. And, I mean, the fact that it's not easy is a testament to just how important it is uh, and just how necessary it is. I mean, if it were easy, we would have done it already, and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. I mean, the fact is, is our entire system... Our entire culture now is becoming premised on monetary power, and we need to address that as a, as a polity, as a, as a political unit. We have to address that as a community. If we want to be a community of political equals with a representative government, uh, we have to address that. And the, you know, the tremendous irony in all of this is that the United States understands its historical mission and importance as the country that defeated aristocracy, uh, right, where political power was premised on royal birth and there was no popular sovereignty. It was uh, the sovereignty of the monarch. Uh, we, we understand our whole historical importance as uprooting that model, defeating it in battle, and establishing a government of the people for the people by the people. Uh, and then we understand our importance in terms of de- uh, defeating communism, where it was the party, the, the communist party that dominated politics and the economy, and we defeated, we like to think that we defeated communism. Uh, and yet, you know, you go from one form of oppression with aristocracy and uh, communism, you go then straight to plutocracy in a way. Uh, is our country really standing for meaningful democracy, or are we standing for capitalists dominating people who don't hold capital? And that's where the economic studies come in. You know, you read Thomas right. Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, and many of the other economists writing in this in this country, not France, are all finding the same things, which is that we're becoming an oligarchic sort of society where people who own capital are gaining much higher returns than people who depend on wages. And the power of capital is only increasing and becoming more and more aggregated. And so eventually, you know, we'll have the right to vote, but you won't control anything in terms of the, the terms that you agree to for getting any corporate service or good. Uh, and you'll be so economically disadvantaged that it'll hardly matter because your politicians are accountable to those who've got the money to fund their campaigns and to maintain their super PACs. And, and, and what of the opportunity for, say, one or two uh, justices to switch? I mean, we've been talking about 5-4 splits, yeah. and you know there was even talk uh, after the 2012 election, that perhaps it wasn't it wasn't beyond the pale that the Supreme Court would would uh, revisit uh, Citizens United just based upon the explosion of money. You know, you, you see Sheldon Adelson single handedly changed the, uh, the 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 direction of the Republican primary, for instance. Um, what of just simply um, a new Supreme Court? Yeah, I mean, that could happen, or it might not happen, but let's assume it does happen. Okay, let's assume, I don't know, four, eight years from now, uh, or maybe sooner, maybe uh, President Hillary Clinton gets to replace 
uh, I don't know, uh, Justice Scalia or somebody like that. Uh, so that's a temporary thing. You know, so first of all, there's no guarantee that they'll come out the way you expect them to, right. uh, because they do have total judicial independence once they're in office. But the other thing is, even if they do come out the way you'd hope, and they overrule Citizens United, and they overrule McCutcheon, how long is that going to last? Another 10 or 20 years until uh, the conservative free market ideologues are back in power, and they've got their own justices restacking the court. Uh, that kind of back and forth is just completely unacceptable when you're talking about the foundation of our democracy and the foundation of our economy. You can't have a good, sustainable, accessible form of capitalism if you can't have common sense regulation. And you can't have common sense regulation if your politics have been captured by wealth. And, 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 so, and so lastly, so give me a sense of, of what that uh, constitutional amendment would be. And one of the things that I, I, I hear raised that is one of the only sort of uh, um, valid, in my estimation, sort of uh, caveats is what do you do about the fact that our media um, is owned by these corporations? I mean, how do you uh, draw the lines here? Yeah, I mean, I personally, uh, I haven't studied the media question in sufficient depth, so take this with a grain of salt. But I would like to see a regular, uh, a form of corporate law that didn't allow co corporate consolidation of media companies, didn't allow corporations that are really dedicated to, uh, I don't know, automobiles or oil or whatever it is, also having uh, subsidiaries or all of these uh, interests in media corporations. I think the media corporation, if it really is going to be uh, the third estate, and if it really is going to play this vital role in democracy, the opinions of media corporations need to be more independent than that. So the media corporation should not just be a front for the economic interests of some other kind of corporation. So I would like to see a massive reform in the area of uh, law governing media consolidation. Uh, but that's not something I write on, and please take that with a grain of salt. I mean, the the other it's simple to have a media exemption. Uh, that's not hard to do, and existing law even has has that. Uh, so, I mean, I would maintain a media exemption. I would seek reform of laws governing media corporations. But basically, the main thing you need to do is allow Congress the authority to limit donations and expenditures and overrule this idea uh, of money as speech and corporations as having every bit as much of a right to that speech as Thomas Paine does. Uh, you really need to set that straight on the record within the text of the Constitution and restore congressional authority. Timothy Kuhn, uh, author of Capitalism versus Democracy, Money and Politics and the Free Market Constitution. We will link to it at our, uh, on our site at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Sam.